Pew Research that is known for so many of its different um, surveys, statistical results, and so forth, published an article with this title. Things will never be the same. How the pandemic has changed worship. No doubt, probably every one of us has had a thought or two or three or more about that very thing over the last couple of years. I want you to listen to some of this. I'm not going to read the entirety of the article, but I do want to read bits and pieces. This is directed at churches as a whole or talking about churches as a whole in the United States, so not a particular segment, denomination, group, or anything like that. But listen to just some of what this says, and I want you to think in the back of your mind, when was this written? That's that's what I want you to be thinking about and see if you can guess. I didn't tell you when yet. I want you to see if you can guess when this was written. Christian worship in the United States, long characterized by its adherence to tradition, appears to have been significantly altered by the coronavirus pandemic. Things will never be the same, says one gentleman in Naples, Florida, one of nearly 400 churchgoers who shared with NPR how the pandemic has changed their views of church life and their expectations for worship in the months and years ahead. I love my fellow brothers and sisters in God, the gentleman wrote. I used to go to many church-related activities like Bible studies and men's fellowship. Now we barely communicate by text. A survey by the Pew Research Center in April found more than 90% of regular churchgoers in the United States saying their churches had closed their doors to combat the spread of coronavirus with a vast majority saying that worship service had moved entirely online. Social hours and church suppers are a thing of the past, at least for now. The changes are not all negative. Many pastors have intensified efforts to stay in touch with members of their congregations and maintain their church communities. The crisis has actually caused us to do a better job of picking up the phone and checking on our members, one gentleman said. It's made me refocus on connecting individually with people. I have our staff checking on every elderly person in the congregation every couple of weeks to see what they need and how we can serve them. So there are some connections that are probably stronger now than they were before. The shift to online communication on platforms such as Zoom has also introduced some new efficiencies. One lady said that she had been attending worship services at least twice a week with her family plus leading Bible study sessions with other members. Under the shutdown, she says now she's been able to do even more. I do not have to drive an hour to sit and read the Bible with someone, she said. I can do it all from home. There's no running to meetings. There's no strain on my kids. There's no strain on my husband. I'm not always rushing somewhere. It's almost, She said almost it's like God send, is sending everyone to their room for a time out. With all the business taken away, the busyness taken away, I can just be still and really focus on my relationship with God. The article goes on, though, to say this, that in some cases, however, the coronavirus shutdowns have weakened church connections. The Pew survey and a survey by Public Religion Research Institute found that one-third or more of those who had previously attended church regularly were not bothering to watch online services. For those whose church affiliation was already tenuous, the disconnect may be permanent. I wasn't regularly attending church anyway, says one lady, so it really hasn't changed anything, but now I feel less guilty about not going. I thought at first that this situation might encourage me to do more online worship, but it really hasn't. Though raised in the evangelical tradition, she says she found her own time and space for spiritual connection. And here's the rest of the quote. And it doesn't usually happen on Sunday mornings.
So here's what I want you and I to think about. I want to go back to my original statement just about the article and the question. But first, this major question. Is church worship in danger? Now, when do you think that article was written? All right, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. You don't have to be embarrassed. Do you think that article was written in 2022? If you think it was written in 2022, raise your hand. Y'all just chicken to raise your hand in church. If you think it was written in 2021, raise your hand. There's a few hands. If you think it was written in 2020, raise your hand. So we're kind of split between 2020 and 2022. Let me ask one further question. If I go ahead and tell you it was written in 2020, you think it was written late in 2020 or early in 2020? It was written in May of 2020. That's how quickly that research could find and see that something like a pandemic in America would make it where worship, you remember the, the headline of the article? Worship would never be the same. Never be the same. I don't know about you, but that just almost like gives me chills. Because what's changed about worship in two years? As far as biblically, what's changed about worship in two years according to God? It should always be the same. Now, I'm not trying to be unaccommodative and ununderstanding of a situation when we have a major sickness and such going on. Don't misunderstand me there. But biblically, scripturally, worship has not changed. It doesn't matter if we're going through wartime, a pandemic, civil war, social unrest. It does not matter. None of that matters when you really boil it down to what the Bible, what Scripture, what God has said about worship. It doesn't change. And we may have to do some creative things to try to make it happen, so to speak. And we certainly did that even here at Sandlin Road. But the big principle I want us to all understand today is that scripturally, worship does not change. It should be us changing to be better at worshiping God. Not us trying to change the way the means by which, the time, whatever it is, of worship on our end. What I've got on the screen for you here is actually, this is actually a, a, an image copyrighted by Edgar Winter in 2013, way before the pandemic. And what he had to say about uh, the, the situation of worship is, is that we have we've e evolved in worship. Not in a good way, but in a bad way. There's been a worship evolution through the years. And what it, what it began as is a true worship of purity, transparency, prudence, dignity, of prostrate to the ground before God. You read about that in the scriptures, how that people fell down before God, their face to the earth, and it was a, a humble submission in response to God. There's a second phase of dependence on God, seeking the favor and a, a grateful heart toward God. So now, yes, maybe you're on bended knee, but you are still in a very humble position before God. A, a position of disposition of service. This is, he put it as an image of on two knees, as though you're ready to get up, but you are still before your master. You are ready to get up and serve, but you are still before your master. And then all of a sudden, it's like our eyes lifted up and we became independent. We had personal interests. We had a change of vision. We decided we would see things our way as far as how we would worship and serve God. And then we actually stood up. We stood up and said, okay, I can stand before God. Let's just think about that for a second. That kind of sounds like shameful to even say out loud, right? That I would have an attitude in which I can stand before God. But if you examine our worship, that's what's happened. And then all of a sudden, it's, are we really even worshiping God? 
at some point, worship has gone to where we're not even worshiping God anymore. It's a self-indulgence. It's a self-worship. It's an idolatry. It's fun. It's not even worship directed at God. It's just changed. And so in this, I think it's, it's just a great kind of visual to think about how do we get where we are or how could we get where some people have gone if we don't watch out and examine and really study what worship is. Because worship certainly involves some things on, on well, if I find my pointer, it involves some things in all of this to some degree. But when we get all the way to this end of it, I think we would all agree that, okay, well, well that's clearly not scriptural if it's all about just myself. That's not worship. So let's study a little bit about worship. Now read. Ephesians 4, and in that context, as you read it, you see that God has put together a plan for a leadership of ministry and service, teaching and guidance within the Lord's church, and it's in order that we might all benefit, that each one may serve, that each one may contribute and be a part of it. So let me ask some questions real quick. What is your place in worship? If I ask you that today, you might initially say, well, I don't have anything to do today. I, I'm not leading singing. I don't, I'm not leading prayer. I'm not leading at the time of communion. I'm not preaching. I'm not teaching a class. You might start with all the I'm nots. Okay, well, what are you? What are you in worship? Are you a participant? Are you a spectator? Could I just submit that in my opinion, Americans like a clearly defined role of each of those? That Americans, at times, we want to be a spectator. That's why we'll pay crazy money for tickets to certain events, right? And we'll buy a ticket and we will go and we will go with the intent of sitting and watching other people do something, paying a high price where we want to be a spectator. That's what we want to do. On the other hand, Americans at times like to be participants. And we like to actually do something and be involved in something. And so you'll see any number of things that you can pay for an experience, right? Like you, you purchase a ticket to go and be a part of an experience. How about the people that are paying like millions of dollars to ride a rocket just barely into outer space? You know, like they, I mean, they don't just want to be a spectator. They want to be in the seat, strapped in, risking their life, you know, and call themselves an astronaut by the end of that, right? They want to experience it. And that's kind of a couple of extreme examples there. But think about that when it comes to you and it comes to worship. Are you a spectator? Are you a participant? Well, biblically, scripturally, as Christians, we're all participants. You don't have to be the preacher. You don't have to be the song leader. You don't have to be leading the prayer to be a participant. The communion in which we just shared a moment ago is a prime example of that. We are all stopping and pausing together to put our mind in the same place and participate in partaking of the same emblems to remember our Lord. And we're all doing that together. Not just a select few and not just a select one or two or anything like that. When we sing, it's the same thing, right? Yeah, you've got a song leader. But every song leader would tell you that they really are not concerned about the song leading part unless they've got people to lead and others to participate. It's not. It's it's. There's not really any joy in feeling like you're singing a solo. It's not it. Well, how would you describe God from a worship standpoint? I, I want to put it in a few categories, okay? Because I believe this gets at the heart of why you worship the way you do. Okay? And before I even go through these, can I just say that, that 
Singing with the little children probably helps me more than anybody could ever know. To remember who God really is and who I am in view of that. So how would you describe God to a young child? We do it through those songs, don't we? He made us. He's big. He's worthy of worship. He loves me. How would you describe God to an unbeliever? I think this might be part of our problem in evangelism and discipleship is that we often go in leading with the issues and leading with major questions instead of just talking about who God is. If you can get into a conversation with somebody about who God is, inevitably you're going to get to the response of where they are in relationship to God. Which, yeah, that's going to get into potentially issues and teaching and all of those things. But to lead with the teaching is to have left out God in a lot of cases. Who is the object of our worship? God is. Not ourselves. Not any other person or thing. It's God. So an unbeliever that we cross paths with, we need to have some way to be able to open the conversation of him about who God really is. What about to a stranger? You have no idea. You have no idea if they're a Christian or not. No idea. They could be just as faithful of a Christian as you, or they could be as alien to the whole thing as an atheist. But do you know a way to say something about God and who he really is that would be beneficial, understood, and heard by anybody? That could be your neighbor down the street that you've never really had a chance to fully talk to. Somebody in the grocery store. But maybe in a moment like that where you're just out and about, an acknowledgement of God in an honest and truthful way as really a moment of your own worship to God might be some of the greatest witnessing that you and I can do. You ever been around somebody and something good happens and they just say something simple like, God is good. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. When's the last time that you and I said something like that? When we were out and it wouldn't matter who was around, but we just recognized that something good has happened and that all good things come ultimately through God. And we just acknowledge that. You See the difference that is in just your attitude about who God is? To just recognize and stop and say, God is good. What about to a fellow Christian? You know, we like to describe people when we love them and adore them and spend time with them. Like any, any don't don't raise your hands. This could be embarrassing. But I mean, if you grandparents brag on your grandkids, about how cute they are and how smart they are. When's the last time, for lack of a better term, when's the last time you bragged on God? To a fellow Christian, somebody who you know is going to appreciate it and understand it. That you just spoke in ways in which to honor God, to acknowledge God, to praise God, to be thankful and grati- to have gratitude toward God. How would you describe it? Because when you think about that, a lot of those things are going to cultivate and actually bring them to the surface where your heart is when it comes to worship. You have a heart that is ready to worship. When you come to worship, what percent of your focus is on God? For you younger mothers, it's really tough, isn't it, when you got kids? A couple of our young moms have already had to step out this morning to deal with kids. It's hard to have a high percentage of focus on things when you've got distractions like small children and such. But what about any of us? Isn't it, isn't it easy for any of us to get distracted? Isn't it easy for any of us to think ahead about what's coming next today at lunch or in the evening or what's coming next this week or what happened last week that we just can't get over? Whatever it is to be distracted. Do you look forward to worship? Hey, that's a key thing, right? 
when we buy a ticket and we want to go be a spectator somewhere, we look forward to that, right? Count down the days when we buy a ticket and we're going to participate in an experience, something that we know we're going to get to do and be a part of and enjoy. We look forward to that day with great anticipation. Do you look forward to worship? If you don't, then I, I, can, I, can, I, can I ask something of you? If you don't, let me ask a follow-up question. Who have you talked to about that? I would, I'd love to hear about it. Let's talk. The elders here probably would love to hear about it. Let's talk. Your brothers and sisters in Christ will probably want to hear about it. Let's talk. Is it a problem among us? Is it a problem in us? Is it an individual problem that needs help getting over? What is it? If you don't look forward to worship, can we acknowledge that we've got a problem? What do you get out of worship? When you leave worship, do you feel more full spiritually? When you leave worship, do you feel more energized spiritually? Recharged? Do you feel closer to God? What does God get from your worship? Does God hear you singing? Does God hear you praying? Does God feel your presence close to His spiritually when you worship because you're plugged in and you're in it? Not as a spectator. Not just in it for the experience, but that you are participating. God alone is worthy of worship. We really also get a lot of things kind of mixed up in our lives too, don't we? Where we end up worshiping a career, a job, our own family, our own possessions, some other idolatrous type thing. And I think in many cases, maybe what we have done in America, especially because of how richly blessed we are, is that we've ultimately reduced God down to something that we can understand and we can manage. We can fit it in our schedule. We can fit it into our plans. We can fit it into what we are comfortable experiencing. And remember the warning in Romans chapter 1. There's a great lengthy reading there in, in Romans 1, 18 through 32, where Paul really just gets at the reality of not having a proper worship and attitude and response to God. But in verse 25, the real golden nugget of the whole thing is when he says to them that those who have done these wrongful things, they have worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. There are atheists in our world that worship the creatures. You think about that for a second. There are atheists who scientifically, you know, intellectually and so forth are in awe of things in creation. And yet will do everything in their power to, dis to destroy the thought that there is an almighty God responsible for the creation of those things. Can't explain fully the creation of those things. But will worship. You see how messed up you can get in the mind to be worshiping the creature instead of the creator. And it will funnel down into even our own lives. Where when we look at the, our response to those questions about worship, we may or may not be anywhere on the right path. And largely it may be because we are spending too much time worshiping the creation all around us in some form or fashion instead of worshiping the creator. In Exodus 32, the people said, come, make us gods that should go before us. As for Moses, we do not know what's become of him. That seems to be largely the attitude of people even today. Let's make our own gods. Let's have our own awesome experiences. Let's have our own awesome spectator events. Because they don't see the awesomeness of God anymore. Where did he go? He didn't go anywhere. We've drifted. 
Maybe we desire like a buffet bar religious experience. We're not satisfied with just what the scripture says. And so we want to pick and choose what we want to do and how we want to do it. Remember what Hebrews 12 says. Therefore, since we received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Guys, it's not up to us. <laughs> We're standing before the Almighty God, kneeling before the Almighty God, bowing before the Almighty God. We need to listen to Him as to how He wants us to worship. Jesus said in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The statement in 1 Corinthians 14 to a, a church that had a lot of problems, and Paul was teaching them about how to worship, concerns with their worship. He really, in a sense, summed it up with a, an ending type statement of let all things be done for edification, and then further, let all things be done decently and in order. If you're not doing it to edify, and it's not done in some kind of orderly fashion, essentially Paul's saying that's not good, it's not going to work, it's not what God approves of. If, so a couple of things we need to think about. If what we're doing in worship brings everybody down, do we have some thinking to do? Some studying to do? Some checking our heart to do? Asking why that's the case? Is the answer to if our worship is bringing everybody down to go, all, go full outside the scriptures and do whatever makes everybody happy? No, clearly not. Maybe it just means we need to cultivate it and learn what it means to worship again. On the other side, if what we're doing is bringing everybody down and we just need to be better at it, then that's a, that's a real thing we need to check on, isn't it? To do it God's way. God is always worthy of our worship. I'm going to go quickly through a few of these because it's just kind of hammering home some reminder points. But he's the creator. He knows all things. He can do all things. He holds together all things. He's above all things. There is no doubt who the object of our worship is to be. It is God. In John 4, 23, this is again Jesus. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. He's seeking that. Is that the way that you and I are going to worship our God? As true worshipers in spirit and truth, being the worshiper that God is seeking. That's what we need to think about. And so in this worship evolution, maybe you need to think about which one you are. Which, which, which one kind of describes who you are today versus who you know you need to be when it comes to how you worship God. When we think about those questions that I began with, or some similar questions, what's your place in worship? Do you look forward to worship? What do you get out of worship? What does God get out of worship? Hey, key thing, did you know that you're made to worship? You know, some people think, well, he was just made to be a preacher. He was just made to be a song leader. Or he was made to lead prayer. He could just do it. But, you know, really, that's, there's some truth, I guess, to that because God does show that he gives gifts and talents and abilities to different ones, just as we read at the very beginning in Ephesians 4. But he made every one of us to worship. Every single one of us are made to worship. In Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That verse is not written just to preachers, not just to elders, not just to deacons, not just to song leaders. No, that's written to Christians. We are his workmanship. In Romans 6, 13, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. That verse is not written just to elders or just to deacons or just to preachers. Who is it that's playing their personal instrument in righteousness to God? It's Christians. It's every one of us. In 
In Colossians 3, 16 and 17, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Again, these verses are not written just to elders, to deacons, to preachers, to song leaders. Who are the ones that are to have this word of Christ dwelling in them richly? Who are the ones that are to be teaching and admonishing one another in these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Who are the ones that are to be singing and making this melody in their heart to the Lord? Christians. Worship will never be the same if Christians refuse to worship. That's what I want to respond to that article. It's not about a pandemic. That was a harsh reality we had to deal with. And who knows what else may come around the corner. But those harsh realities are too often the devil's workshop to carve out weak brothers and sisters in the faith. And to change the hearts even of those who are strong. To let in more weakness and wickedness. Worship will be the same if Christians worship God the way He has asked us to. It will be. The mediums may be a little bit different. I dare say Paul never wore a microphone up on his face like this. I dare say that Paul and Silas in the prison might have liked to have had a hymn book so that they could, you know, say, oh, this is a good one. Let's sing this one. The mode and the medium by which we do things, that, that may, but that doesn't actually change the worship. What are we made to do? Just think with me quickly about this. I know I'm running up against time. What are we made to do? We're, Aren't we made to pray? And sometimes we struggle with prayer and we don't quite know what to say, but ultimately we're capable of it. We're commanded to do it. We're made to pray. Can a dog pray? Well, you know, in their own way, I guess. They can beg, right? Can we be taught to pray? Probably all of us, in one way or another, have been taught to pray. But what are we made to do? We're made to give. And and some better than others, and sometimes we wrestle with it as to whether we should or shouldn't, or how much, or whatever it may be, or how good we feel about it. But you know what? You, You and I probably all know somebody who's a great giver. They're always willing to give. Okay, well, let's back that up and just examine something with me. Do you see that God made us capable of giving? And then he's asked us to do it. To give so that we can care for those in need. Hey, Jesus took it further than that, didn't he? You know, we often talk about what the apostles had to say about giving in the church. But do you remember what Jesus said about it? He said, give to the ungrateful and the wicked. And then you'll be sons of your Father in heaven. What are we made to do? Aren't we made to read and study and teach? We can do that. Some better than others. Some still growing and learning, but we are capable Reading, studying, teaching. Scriptures talk about it throughout. First Timothy 4, verse 13, Paul said, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, or to teaching. But Acts 17, 11, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, the Bereans, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Capable of that, right? That was early church days. Comparing Thessalonica and Berea. In Thessalonica, they weren't as ready to do that. But did this text seem to indicate that they were capable of doing it? Well, yeah. There's a comparison being made. 
In other words, we're all capable of it. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The word of God is given to us that we may read, that we may study, and that we may teach. And if you notice the way that it is written and the way that it is laid out, not I'm talking about book chapter, I'm not even talking about book chap, chapter and verse, but the way that it is presented, it is presented in such a way as, in a lot of cases, a story to be retold, a command or an example to be followed, or an exhortation to be repeated. They are there, like repeatedly, over and over and over. You have a story that you can read and then you can go tell. You have a command that you can follow. Or you have an exhortation that you can repeat and share with others. It's there over and over and over. We're made to do this, friends. Read, study, teach. We're made to sing. Okay, some of you not so much. No, I'm just kidding. We're made to sing. We may not be made to sing well, <laughs> but we're made to sing. The, the commands are there. The examples are there. The teachings are there. But we're made to sing. We're capable. Maybe we need to work on being more capable and, and improving that. But the biggest thing is to be committed to doing that. That's the biggest thing. Committed to doing it. We're made to do it. We're made to remember and proclaim. We have memory. We have a sense of nostalgia, a sense of importance. We can place Christ within our hearts in the right place upon that cross and upon his resurrection and upon his ascension so that when we come together in communion to remember our Lord, we are capable of doing that. And it will drive feelings and thoughts and emotions and remembrances inside of us. We are made to do that. Isn't that amazing in a sense that God has made us with a mind that can do that? We remember. We're made to proclaim it too. To share it. Share that message with others. So in, in view of all of that, I want to come back to that original article again because I just, I want to argue with it. I don't agree. I don't agree that worship will never be the same. I would submit the thesis that worship never changed. We did. Worship never changed. We did. So let's repent. Let's get back to worship. Not just in attendance, not just that. Let's get back to having the heart of worship that knows how to talk about God. Give God acknowledgement and praise. And yes, worship God in all the ways that he's made us to do. So think on that. Chew on that. Sleep on that. And I'm serious. If there are things in, in your mind that we need to bring to the table, even here in this local assembly, I fully believe that our elders would welcome that. Because God is always worthy of worship. And if worship seems to be struggling or failing, then we definitely need to look at the mirror and ask ourselves, where are we failing? Because God's not failing. Let's just be better. And not let worship to God change. If you're not a child of God today, why not? I'd ask you, what are you doing here at 10 after 12? <laughs> you're not a Christian. So if you're not a Christian, we'll stay here a little longer if you want to be baptized. Jesus himself said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. We quoted it with the little children up here this morning. That's why I went to the cross. 
you've got something in your life that you need to confess and make right among your brethren, we'll stay a little longer for that too. By repentance and prayer, we can be restored. Be back in a proper place to worship God. From a sincere and an honest heart. So if there's a need that you have, whatever it may be, we'd ask you to come while we stand and sing.